All right. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining the Northwest Quadrant Virtual Preparedness Town Hall. I'm Haley Randall, the Program Assistant for the Zoo and Aquarium All Hazards Partnership. Before we begin, we're just going to go th through a few quick logistical reminders. All participants have been muted upon entry, and we ask you to remain muted throughout the informational portion of the webinar. You will be able to unmute yourself during the breakout sessions and the Q&A components of the webinar. You should see that a live transcription has been enabled for this webinar at the bottom of your screen. To disable this feature, to view a full transcript in a separate window, or to change the settings, just click the caret next to live transcript at the bottom of your screen. Presentation portions of this webinar are being recorded and will be posted to our website, zap.org, in the next few days. Breakout sessions will not be recorded. I will be available to assist you throughout the webinar and during breakout rooms, so if you're having any technical difficulties, please message me and I'll do my best to help you out. I will now turn it over to Dr. Yvonne Nadler, Senior Veterinary Advisor for the Zoo and Aquarium All Hazards Partnership, to kick us off and introduce our first panelist. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, thank you so much, Haley. For those of, of you that don't know me, um, I'm Dr. Yvonne Nadler. Like um, Haley said, I'm the Senior Veterinary Advisor for ZAP, and I have the distinct pleasure today of introducing our first speaker, who is Dr. Minden Buswell. And for those of you that don't know her, she is, I'm going to get it screwed up, the Emergency Programs um, Veterinarian for the State of Washington. Is that close enough, Mindy? Close enough, yes. Close enough, awesome. So she is a lady that you really need to know, and the thing that's really um, fascinating about Mindy is that she has held virtually every office within the National Alliance of State Animal and Agricultural Emergency Programs, or NASA. So um, she is at the highest level of uh, organizations for those of uh, state folks whose job it is, is to plan for animals and disasters. So she, she knows all the movers and shakers. So we're really lucky to have her here today, and I will let Mindy take it away. Hello. Thank you, Yvonne. And Yvonne's been on the board with, I've been longer than I have, so she's she's underrating herself there. <laughs> but um, I'm going to go ahead and have some slides just to kind of give uh, a presentation that I gave last week at the oh, let's see here. There we go. Let me go back. Somehow I got forgot to to dis go way back. Sorry, give you all. There we go. So the Washington State Emergency Management Association. So what I want to talk to you about this is, you know, if you aren't aware or are not working with your county emergency management where your location is you need to be in contact with them. So whatever county emergency management, because as we know, <clears throat> all emergencies start at the local level. So if you need stuff or you need help in an emergency scenario, uh, you know, if you're not tagged into your county or your municipality for, for help, they don't know that, that you're out there or you, or you haven't reached out to them, uh, you know, you're not gonna get the help as rapidly as you would want. So if you have a relationship with them, um, or if you haven't, I would reach out to them and say, hey, we're here, and this is how we can check in with you in an emergency. And the nice part is, is even in a non full county emergency, let's say it's just an emergency for you, you for, the, for your operation, you, know, you can still go and call them and ask them for help. Let's say you know you have a, a, um, a boat hit your pump <laughs> and it's just your problem um, and not like a, a citywide problem. They're still there and they can still try and help you kind of manage that situation if needed. So please do that, please reach out. Um, and what I want to tell you is kind of give you a little bit of an understanding of the um, capabilities in the state of Washington right now in animal response. And so <clears throat> for those of you that are familiar with 
how emergencies run, we run on the National Incident Management System, um, just like nationally, and, and it's how the United States and, and Washington responds to an emergency. And so at the state level, the governor gives each agency a um, emergency support function, which is an ESF function. So, and it usually relates to what we do, you know, in our everyday basis. So the Washington State Department of Agriculture, you know, we are given <clears throat> emergency support function 11, which is the primary agencies would be Department of Agriculture and Fish and Wildlife. And that's because we are the ones that deal most of the agriculture and animals. And so um, in this annex, the in, you're going to see some of these terms, but basically there is a comprehensive emergency management um, <clears throat> plan. And so that's just for the state, a whole plan is like, how are how is the state going to respond to this? And so, you know, in in all honesty, to give you kind of a high level understanding, you know, all emergencies start at the local level, like we said. So your municipalities and or your, your county are in charge of that emergency that's happening in your area. They're always gonna be in charge. There's no such thing as the state coming in and taking over or the feds coming in and taking over. They're always going to be there in support of your local jurisdiction. That's why I keep harping on the fact that you should have a, I really want you all to have a, a working relationship because if, you come to me at the at the state and say, hey, Mindy, I need some help. I need some sort of resource to help me get out of this emergency. I'm going to say I need a mission from your local or county emergency management. I need a request coming from them. And so so that's why it would just circumvent any sort of kind of uh, circular communication if you just went straight to the source and said hey I need this and you know they can send it up the line so if the county runs out of resources they can come to the state and say we're out of resources and we need help and that's why you get a governor's declaration of a state of emergency that's why it's important it seems kind of silly in the grand scheme of things when you're like well the governor signed a piece of paper that says we're in an emergency and like, <laughs> great. However, what that does is open up state resources to the counties. Um, and so then that kind of brings the full force of the state resources for to help support that county or multiple counties that are experiencing an emergency. Um, and that kind of acts at the, at the same level at the as at the federal agencies. So let's say your local emergency local your local emergency manager said, we're out of resources and we came to the state and the state says, we're out of resources. Then we go to the federal um, organizations like FEMA, USDA, sometimes CDC and say, we need help. And that being said, that's why you need a presidential declaration of a state of emergency. And so you know, the one federal declaration that I can think of is, you know, the we had a federal declaration for several, and then there's different levels of it, but several of the fires that have been going on in Washington, but then also the, the mudslide that occurred in Oso, Washington. Um, we had a federal declaration for just Snohomish County. Um, so the, the president signed, you know, Obama signed a declaration saying, oh, you know, Snohomish County is in an emergency and does have access to federal resources. And, those federal resources need to be requested generally through the state. So it kind of goes local to state to state to federal, depending on what's going on. And so for me, we are, this is what I'm supposed to do right now um, in, in peacetime, in times when we're not in an emergency, is I need to plan for all of this. What if a local jurisdiction comes to me and says, I need this? what's my plan uh you know so because here in the emergency support function 11 in our plan it says i'm in charge of 
animal response for rapid response to all animal health events. <laughs> <laughs> and so they say, hey, Mindy, your job is to plan and write and, and think about anything that could happen in the state that involves animals. And then how do you help people with that? And it could, you know, in fact, affecting the health, safety, and welfare of human beings and animals alike. And so I, you know, there's a lot, <laughs> but that includes zoos and aquariums. And so I've been working with some of you folks on making and helping to get some emergency plans in place for zoos and aquariums. But, you know, this is very much within my job requirement to be planning for this. So I wanted to kind of give you an idea of, you know, what jurisdiction I have um to to help you <clears throat> and and just to give you an idea of what animal health events disease toxic substances terrorism natural or technical disasters and disposal of dead animals as well <clears throat> and then also i need to plan for veterinary medicine and animal care activities and the mitigation preparedness response and recovery activity phases of emergency management of natural or technical disasters, including but not limited to small and large animal care, facility usage and displaced pet livestock wildlife and exotic animal assistance. So that's where you guys are. <laughs> so I'm here for you. Uh, you know, and it's 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 mapped out in our comprehensive emergency management plan. So I'm, I'm really happy that for the state of Washington that that any folks that are on here you're always welcome, even in non-emergency times, to reach out to me and ask for any sort of assistance. I'm always available. I might not be able to bring all the resources the state have because we're not in an emergency situation, but I am always an available resource. And then this is just an, an Yvonne has seen this, and Dick Green has been an, you know, a, an animal emergency response. Uh, legend, basically, <laughs> and you know his most recent retirement from ASPCA. But we are woefully ill prepared to be able to respond to the animals' needs in a large-scale event impacting large numbers of animals. We simply don't have the resources, and in those parts of the country where we are rich in resources, we don't have the necessary capabilities to effectively carry out a large-scale, complex operation. So think Cascadia subduction zone. We are not, we're just not going to be able to, to effectively respond to that. Um, and so my, what I'd like to encourage everybody to understand is, well, <clears throat> Washington state says be two weeks ready. I wouldn't expect any help in two weeks at the zoo and aquarium level. <laughs> Um, two weeks ready means for human safety, and um, you know you may you may be able to get help within two weeks for human health and safety. I wouldn't business continuity. I wouldn't bank on, particularly in that large scale event. So anything that you can do to get prepared would be uh, behoove you because. In a large scale event, you can't expect us to help. I mean, my <clears throat> understanding with the Cascadia subduction zone is, you know, with the infrastructure that's down, our bridges and roads and passes, et cetera, you know, I'm here on the west side of Washington. I'm likely going to be a victim of some sort which most of the people that are doing emergency response are going to be. And to get to um, the emergency management, uh, I guess the emergency operations center for the state. Now that building is on a, on a earthquake resilient, uh, actually on a, a spring system almost for earthquake resiliency. Um, and so I, I suspect that that building will still be standing. If we have electricity, we can run that. But you know, I'm effectively 40 minutes away by car. So if I can get there, hopefully once my family is taken care of, I'm going to either have to walk or run or bicycle <laughs> to, 
to get there. So just to give you that capacity, um, what, what capabilities can you shelter in place for, uh, you know, whenever or however long we're going to have to do that? Can you shelter in place? If you can't shelter in place, what is your evacuation? And that's kind of, Yvonne asked me to do the top five things that that I would I would want to you to prepare for, and I think it would be to have a shelter in place plan, an evacuation plan, a cash for both of those things, <laughs> both of those plans, um, and you know a plan for you and your family because you're no good if your family isn't taken care of. And uh, and then I guess the last one would be really uh, to, to have the relationship with your county emergency management. And, and then that we can go from there. But I think that's the five top things that I have that I wanted to kind of cover with you all. And I'm, willing to take any questions now at this point. Mindy, thank you. I just wanna bring forward something that Mindy talked about. And, and you know, I think in a lot of the places that we've talked about, um, you know, we've had kind of had these town halls sort of across the country, you know, roughly by geography, some other folks have joined and whatever. Um, I will have to say the Northwest certainly has its share of very unusual challenges. And, you know, folks that are on the Atlantic coast, like Sharon, that has been through how many hurricanes, Sharon? And having to plan for that. Um, and Sharon will share some of her experience when we get into the breakout rooms, but she has been through a number of hurricanes as have folks in Florida. The big difference I think we're talking about here is, is with those things, you often have some warning. You can you can begin to prepare. You've probably been through a hurricane before and you kind of have an understanding, okay, this went really well, but maybe we need to improve on this for the next time. Well, I think if there is a Cascadia subduction with a tsunami and an earthquake, um, you know, I, I don't wanna discourage people from planning because you know, a disaster, what is the definition of a disaster, right? It's, it's something that's going to be very difficult to rise above. But thinking about those small steps of what would a shelter in place plan look like, even for, for three days, because doesn't FEMA tell us that as a family, we should have our families, we should have enough equipment and, you know, water, etc, to sustain our families for three days. Can we start with that with our zoos and aquariums? What would we have to do? And, you know, think about taking um, inventory, you know, what else might I need to encourage our facility to invest in that would allow us to begin to take these steps that could sustain us for quite a while. And again, I have to thank Mindy for that, uh, you know, disasters begin and end locally pitch. Um, and also the fact that, you know, in so many of these exercises that we're in, that human life health safety comes first. And so, you know, it's hard when you're an animal person to remember that, but I think it's critical if, if you can't take care of yourself and your family, you're not going to be readily available to help at, at the zoological facility. So I will turn it back over to anybody to see if they have questions for Mindy. I, can, can we raise our hands or do, should we ask through the chat? Um, I do see in the chat something that came up, um, Heather Kitchen put in a thought, and Heather, if you wanted to go ahead and introduce yourself, I think that you can do that. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to mention um, that um, I work for Spokane County Emergency Management. And so um, if anybody wanted assistance connecting with whatever county they're in, um, or I can answer direct questions about um, how to 
how it works connecting with uh, county emergency management. Um, I do all of the animal preparedness activities in Spokane County, and I also assist um, with a lot of the other Eastern Washington uh, counties with a lot of their um, preparedness activities when it comes to animals. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I stuck my email up there in the um, in the chat as well. Um, and Mindy knows how to get in contact with me too. Thank you so much, Heather. This is why we love to have our local folks um, join us whenever possible, because I'm willing to bet you not everybody knows knows you or knows what you know what kind of assistance you can give to folks, especially when we're not in a crisis, right? Um, I do a lot of work with zoos, um, particularly on foreign animal disease issues. And the last thing that that you know state regulatory officials want to see if there's an outbreak of a bad disease is understand where, you know, understand that you are woefully unprepared or know nothing about the disease in question. And, uh, you know, that that really can impede um, outbreak response and information sharing. So thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Do we have, do we have any other questions for Mindy? Dr. Buswell? <laughs> Either way. Awesome. Well, she'll be part of the uh, breakout room with Washington and Oregon folks after our uh, uh, next presenter. So we will go ahead and go to our next panelist, who is Dr. Caitlin Hadfield. And Caitlin was graciously volunteering the Seattle Aquarium. Uh, when was that? February of 2020, we were supposed to meet there. This was supposed to be an in-person meeting with a lot more opportunity to, to work on some planning processes and get to know one another better. But in this virtual world, um, you know, we're doing the best we can. So um, like I said, Caitlin is the, the senior veterinarian at the Seattle Aquarium, um, has very unique needs as part of the aquarium community. So I will turn it over to her for her to give her presentation. And thank you so much, Dr. Hatfield. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, so I am going to share my PowerPoint. Can everyone hear me OK? Great. Um, so as Yvonne said, I am Caitlin Hadfield. I'm a senior vet at the Seattle Aquarium. Before I was at the Seattle Aquarium, I was at the National Aquarium for a long time. And um, I ran this little PowerPoint through our safety officer. And he said I should just leave the cartoon up and just say any questions. Um, and <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes about how, where we are in our preparedness. All right, so um, where to start? This is essentially your average risk analysis process. So it doesn't really matter what you're looking at. This is just a different way of wording it. And so it's really starting with trying to identify the most likely hazards and what those might mean for us. How can we mitigate them now? And this is kind of what I'm going to run through where our weak spots are and how can we improve that? And then a big one to not forget when we're thinking about this is how are we gonna recover from all of this? Um, and a big thing to point out here is that we are all gonna be on very different stages of this little journey. There are gonna be folks on this call who have far more planning experience, have actually experienced a lot of these uh, natural and mammy disasters. Um, and there's gonna be folks who don't think they've gotten started, but I promise that they have in some form. And the one thing I would say is we are not aiming for perfection. We're not going to get there. We're just trying to keep building on what we have so we can just improve our preparedness pretty much. Um, so your risk analysis approach, again, it's the same kind of whether you're looking at how good your food is versus um, disaster management. It's identifying the likely hazards and trying to spot which are going to be either the most serious and or the most likely in that combination. Um, and that's obviously going to depend on the scale of the disaster, what the disaster is, where it is. It might not necessarily impact our facility. It might impact our staff's ability to come in. Um, and the duration of it is going to be a huge factor. So when you do that for our little spot, so the Seattle Aquarium, for anyone who hasn't seen it, our current buildings, although we're expanding, are very much mostly on the water, um, at the bottom of a hill covered in loose brick buildings. Um, and we've got a long list of possible hazards, um, including uh, natural disasters, uh, severe weather events, oil spills are on there, civil unrest, a wide variety of foreign animal diseases. The biggest one of most concern for us is uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza. 
And then obviously worrying about the next epidemic or pandemic that's gonna come our way. Um, and if you're in Seattle and want to have an entertaining day, you can check out the King County Seattle Hazard Explorer, which is a little interactive map for all the things that are gonna kill you in different locations in Seattle. It's very exciting. Um, obviously planning all this, the next step is obviously the meteor that's gonna hit the aquarium and how we're gonna deal with that. So the biggest one for us in terms of massive consequence is really a major earthquake. Um, which obviously Mindy's talked about at all as well. We're on the Seattle fault zone. And then the really big concern is that Cascadia subduction zone on our outer coast. If that goes, the, the um, modeling for that is truly, truly quite scary. And we've got a load of weak points. We have a lot of unfortified brick buildings. We are very reliant on bridge and tunnel access. Uh, our aquarium in particular has pier pilings as does the entire waterfront. We've got hills everywhere, we've got gas lines, um, we've got water everywhere, and then we sort of need to be prepared to be essentially on our own for a while and pretty isolated. So that's kind of one of our biggest consequence ones. So what are consequences specifically for our aquarium that we're worried about? There's the obvious one in the event itself, almost sort of regardless of the event, is obviously a human or an animal um, injury or death. And then loss of any kind of structural integrity and kind of potentially associated that is animals getting out. The big one for us is really kind of following on from that. One of the biggest concerns that we have is loss of power. When the Seattle Aquarium loses power, we lose some really critical life support. We lose our saltwater intake. We lose a lot of our water and air pumps and we lose our freezers. Uh, we're also worried about what happens to our saltwater intake. So if something wrong with the water, there's something physically wrong with the intake. Losing our freshwater supply is actually a lower concern than that. And then a huge one, as many spoke about, and they were um, on impact on human safety and access. Our staff, almost all, most of our staff are one bridge away from work at least. So that's a concern. And they're obviously in a major disaster all going to be worried about maintaining their own safety and their family's safety first. And then we're going to have to worry about other supplies coming in and then the loss of income. Just like others using aquariums, we're really heavily dependent on people coming in the door for our source of income. So right now, how are we prepared to mitigate that? Um, we have over the last 10 so plus years really worked on structural support of the aquarium. And you might have seen that work happening over the time. And that is one of the reasons why when the pier next to us fell down, which is that picture, um, it didn't impact us at all, even though that's the view from our balcony and the building in front of that concrete masonry structure is our electrical building. So that was nice to see, that was an exciting day. Um, we have worked on our supplies, so generators, um, liquid and compressed oxygen, emergency packs and food so that we can stay on site when we need to and respond to things. And then we've got a lot of plans. We've used the secure zoo strategy, which is, it's a big thing to get through, but it's a healthy, it's a healthy, it's a helpful way to kind of get started on building some of these and finding some of the weak spots. And then we're continuing to build up our plans. Our biggest ones, like I said, are power failure responses, foreign animal diseases, earthquake and fire. And then in Seattle, there's designated emergency hubs. So making sure that everyone knows where those are. And then drills and training, we rely um, on, uh, we trained our staff on the instant command system and <laughs> we were able to test that on COVID. So that was exciting. We have a great safety officer and we run routinely, we always have emergency response leads on site. And then we've worked to kind of build our local support and there's definitely big gaps in here, um, but zoo and aquarium wildlife facilities, we really want to have a network where we can support each other because the much more likely event is that these disasters are local to one or more facilities and we can help each other. And then we're lucky we've got a fire department just down the road. I think we've got close relations with Department of Public Health, Department of Agriculture and our state vet as well. And then the one thing to highlight for anyone who hasn't received uh, the info in this, but um, documentation of the mitigation measures are, are going to be a USDA license requirement. So where are our weak spots? Um, these are the bits that we are well aware are our weaknesses. One is communications. If cell towers and email are down, we really lose a lot of our sources of communication and that's going to impact us pretty seriously. Diesel for the generators, if it is a long-term widespread power failure, there's gonna be a lot of demand for what diesel there is that can come in and that is gonna be going to the hospitals. So that is a big one for us. 
access, uh, again, especially if roots in are damaged, that's going to be really challenging because where our staff are typically living. Rehousing our animals, probably the most, the hardest ones that we have are actually our tropical fish and invertebrates, so other animals are, are all native to our local area. And then escaped birds or mammals is the other one that we want to prepare for. Those are our weak spots. Um, and then what should help? Uh, so satellite phones, we did have a grant in to try and get some satellite phones, but COVID um, got rid of that little grant. So that's still on the plans. Um, we are in the process of building up our offsite facility. And so having some additional diesel storage over there, some more animal holding over there is gonna help. And then we're continuing to work on our saltwater redundancy. And there's sort of a bunch of measures in work for those. And then some really big expensive ones that are gonna be challenging to work on. We do want access to a larger pool of vehicles and that's both our fleet is growing, but also um, getting help again from our local area is gonna help. And then continuing to build our regional support because we, we're really gonna be relying on each other in these sorts of events, which is one of the reasons for this talk. And then workshops and drills uh, as well to try and help prepare for these things as best as we can, because it's just so much easier to respond to them, even if it's a slightly a different event when we kind of run through the scenario. And that is a picture there of Hurricane Isabel at National Aquarium in Baltimore, um, which created significant more flooding than anyone was prepared for, um, which is quite the event. And then recovery, uh, what we're thinking about on our end, obviously how are we gonna continue operations? We have a resiliency fund, COVID cut into that, and then we have been building that back up again. Um, so that's been very, very helpful when COVID hit. That was really the reason we kept our operations as we did. And then we keep an eye out and we'll continue to monitor for local, state and federal support. And in particular with COVID, the federal support has really made a huge difference to how we're doing. And then making sure our insurance covers what we need it to cover. Um, and then supporting each other. And just again, a reach out. If there is an event, there's any way the Seattle Aquarium can help. I am happy to be the contact person. There are other people, contact people, contact people available. Um, and we are very, very happy to help. Um, it would be, it, it, my, one of my goals is to just keep building up this network that we have locally. And that, I think, is my whole talk. Um, so if anyone does want to reach out to me, that's my email address. And um, I will also uh, be available in the uh, breakout sessions or any other questions that we have. Thank you. Caitlin, that was fantastic. Um, you've obviously put a great deal of thought and time into this. Um, just for the, the sake of the group before you have, you know, before we have a chance to break out, um, who are some of the partners that you used at your local level to help you develop such a robust plan? I, I'm not sure I'd call it robust, but we're building it. Uh, <laughs> it actually, I would say, it's been strengthened a lot by working with Mindy and yourself and ZAHP and building up those contacts through there. And then we have two main contacts at the aquarium, which is myself and the safety officer. And so it's really kind of working together and continuing to reach out to groups. There's a few groups we haven't reached out to yet that are on the list and COVID just stalled all of this. Um, but animal control is one of the big ones. Some of the search and rescue groups we haven't reached out to. Um, and then continuing to, to keep in contact with everyone so we know who we reach out to, how do we reach out, so that in the event of emergency, we're not wasting our time trying to reach someone who can't help um, and, and really sort of make the best use of that initial period, which is the highest risk sort of period. And, and I have to echo that sentiment. Sharon, um, I'm gonna briefly introduce Sharon Stewart and ask her to share a little bit about some of the some of the, um, what she discovered, Sharon used to be uh, with the North Carolina Department of Food and Ag, and she, she really has worked with a lot of agricultural and animal issues. She's been a subcontractor for ZAP for a number of years, and, and she's a very knowledgeable and humble woman. Um, but one of the things we had her do, I hope there's not vodka in that, that bottle there, Sharon. Um, what, what we're hoping, <laughs> what we're hoping, um, I would love for you to explain some of the challenges that you had during COVID reaching out to find appropriate contact folks and how important it is to get people back engaged in the process at that time because of your fact. Yeah, so, so it's a really good point and something that 
most people faced initially uh, is just whoever's on your contact list may or may not be there. One of the other things we ran into was that some in the throes of, of COVID, planned or unplanned, people started retiring in mass. And um, a lot of people were either switching jobs because someone had retired and had been moved around or up. Um, and that's a challenge when you've got a list of, of contact people and the one, your main contact's gone and then where you start. So just trying to, I can't emphasize that enough to make sure that's updated and that you have it as deep as, as it's reasonable with that association. You know, what if they want two people or three people, but have backups in, in that. Um, have every, if you can get a, a private uh, cell phone, if they don't mind sharing that, that's a really good, that's how I found a lot of the state vets because they weren't able to report in the office. And luckily people trusted me enough to give me their a private cell phone. So we were able to get up with people um, that we needed to touch face with. So that was my limited experience with that, but it was a good, um, a good experience to realize that people that you've known forever may not be there for, for a variety of reasons. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and especially people new in the position, they may not know you at all. You know, right. previously established relationships that, you know, that you're trusting on that level may be gone. And I, you know, sometimes it seems like when we have these meetings, um, you know, especially in the time of COVID, you, you feel like you're starting back at the beginning with some of this mm -hmm. basic level of information. And it's, but it's necessary because we've lost a lot of institutional knowledge in this industry. We've lost a lot of institutional knowledge in veterinary medicine, in you know, potentially even emergency management. Yes. We're gonna be starting over with new people. So I think now is the time that we're starting to see ourselves come out of this a little bit, hopefully, is to um, kind of get back re-engaged and figure out you know, a, a, a virus that you know, kind of smacked us upside the head isn't the only hazard that we could be facing um, in the in the near future. So, um, you know, getting back and talking about some of these other all hazards are really important. Um, Haley, do you think, folks now, do you think we wanna break out into sort of like smaller discussion groups that were, were broken out a bit? Ashley, do you have anything to add before we lead into that? Yeah, I was just gonna ask um, for folks to, if you wanna give kind of a vote, we have a little bit, um, less attendees than we anticipated today. There's about 20 of everyone in total. So uh, if it would be preferred, we can stay in one larger group for discussion and we'll still stop the recording and everything, or we can break up into smaller groups. I'm curious um, if anyone has a preference or if you you know, feel strongly and you don't wanna say, feel free to chat me um, with using the chat feature. Yeah, because one of the things we're going to do is we're going to go around to the attendees and, and ask you to introduce yourself, say what institution that you're from, and maybe give us a reason why you're attending today's webinar. So I'll let Ashley kind of call out the order here. If if that if indeed we want to all stay together, does that is that agreeable to folks? Somebody nod their head. All right. I saw a couple of folks message that they, they want to do a large group and some other thumbs up. So we're going to do okay. it that way. I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording.